Hi, I'm David Wright. Thank you very much for joining me for another edition of People and Politics. If you're not already done so, please subscribe to the show. I'd be very grateful. Today's guest, I'm really looking forward to talking to her. Uh, Monica Lennon has been around the Scottish Parliament since 2016 when she first got elected and has brought in some really big policies and had a big impact since then. So today we're going to talk about her environmental policy and uh, work she's done with Inclusion Scotland. I'm really looking forward to who you are to. Welcome to People in Politics. Monica Lennon, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm, I'm so I'm so grateful for your time. Oh, David, thank you for the invitation. I was really touched to to get the invite to come on your your podcast. I think it's going to go from strength to strength in 2024. So good to see you, and thanks for having me on. As I put it, you know, as I said, yeah, I'm so enjoying doing the pod, podcast. It's uh, I'm, I'm so grateful everybody that comes on it because uh, it, it just gives me a chance to talk about politics what they're all doing so there's nothing uh, there's nothing I talk so it's good so um, and I, and I, I, I've made a little plan for today and you can tell me what you think about it, but uh, if it's okay with you I thought we'd talk about your, a bit about your environmental work and and then get on to disability and quality school because you're a patron of uh, that disability charity and also if we get out I would like to ask you about the ongoing uh, effect of the role of free sanitary products because that was a big policy at that time and uh, I was doing my research and you were elected to the Parliament in 2016. And to, uh, to be honest, I thought you'd been around a lot longer. But <laughs> I don't know if that's a compliment or not, David. <laughs> it's an absolute compliment, because I think you have a big impact, you know. Short time, big impact, so that's a great. But uh, I was watching you some years ago, uh, yeah, yeah, you're very big on environmental policy, and the most recent thing is, you know, monies from the Scotland scheme seem to have gone with the wind. I wonder if you ever got to the bottom of that story, or if you're likely to get to that that story. Yeah, well, first of all, I like a man with a plan. I love the fact you've got a plan here. And from your research, you might know that I am a, a planner at heart. So I can talk a bit more about my background in environmental planning and that work and how it you know connects with my politics now. But yeah, so I'm a member of the, the Scottish Parliament's Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. So just this week, we had an evidence session with two cabinet secretaries and one is Shona Robeson who wears two hats in government now as deputy first minister and the cabinet secretary for finance so she's in charge of of the budget and sitting next to her was Neil Gray who's the cabinet secretary of responsibility for the well-being economy and fair work and energies within his portfolio so our committee we had you know limited time to to quiz both of the the cabinet secretaries together um and I suppose I started off by asking some questions to really see how confident the ministers are that the spending decisions that they're making now um is that going to get us on track to meet our really important um emissions reduction targets so there's interim targets 
for 2030, but that's only six years away, David. Uh -huh. And then there's the big targets for 2045. So I don't know. I, I just don't think they sounded that confident or convincing. But on the issue of Scotland, you know, for your viewers. Yeah, you know, I was the uh, if you did this, explain and and to me about the context of Scotland and what that's about. Yeah, so I think it's fair to say that Scotland is a leader in renewables, renewable energy, and it's an industry that is growing, not growing fast enough, but Scotland um, has, you know, given our natural resources and the political ambition over different governments, you know, that's been a real priority. So the next phase of that is how do we really increase offshore uh, renewables? And what the Scottish government um, has done is, is basically invite private uh, investors to bid for plots on Scotland's seabed, basically. And it's like if you were taking a lease on a, a, a big housing site, you put down a big deposit or a deposit, and then it gives you the option to then buy, and then you put down the full amount. So it's a bit like that with Scotland. Some critics of the Scottish government say that they've sold Scotland's seabed off too cheaply? Yeah, I was about to say, I've spoken to another MSP politician and uh, I've heard that banded about that, you know, I've heard that they've sold the seabed really cheaply and that's part of the problem. Yeah, and, and I have concerns about that too. I mean, my preference would have been that we approach the just transition to try and shift from a fossil fuel-based economy um, to looking at more renewable and cleaner energy, um, but to do that very much through public ownership, where we can have more public accountability and profits can go back into to public infrastructure. But yesterday wasn't really to unpick the... The, the principles of it, it was to say, well, okay, so you did a, a, a round where you got the first um, down payments. What's happened with that money? Because the Scottish government promised that the money received for that would be used for tackling the climate and nature emergency. Yeah. And we know that's a global emergency, but we know it's having real impacts in Scotland. But what they've been doing to try and balance the books, and legally the government has to balance the books, is they've been taking some of that Scotland money um, and they've been putting it into the budget to just try and balance things out. Um, Shona Robeson, as the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, she wasn't able to say you know, what that money's been used for. So initially it was 56 million, but now we know that it's closer to 700 million and it's going to be used um, again in general spending. Um, and we don't know if in future budgets they intend to put that back. So I think they're trying to take a really optimistic view that, oh, don't worry, there's more money to come. These are just deposits and we're going to see potentially billions coming in. There's just a lot of unknowns. Um, the thing about committees, you go along and you try and put your party hat at the door because you're there to go in and scrutinise, follow the evidence, right. work as a team in the committee. It can get a little bit frustrating and sometimes politics will just seep in. But the thing that really struck me yesterday about the session with um, Shona Robeson and Neil Gray is that I think the most common answer, not just to me, but to all the other committee members was, I'll get back to you on that. Um, let me write to the convener, let me write to the committee. So we had two people at the top of government um, not really able to give the detail, not able to answer the questions. Uh, yeah, uh, I was very conscious of that when I watched the playback because Sean Robertson can't come back to the line of what that we're using it to support the budget or we're using that to prop up the budget. But I should write what said the SNP, you know, they pride themselves on, you know, line by line detail of where money should come and go from it. And that was that severely lacking detail, uh, you know, saying that we prop up the budget. Well, what does that mean? How we spent it on health, that we have spent on education, it can mean anything. Well, it can, and, you know, it happens in politics 
you know, people throw around big numbers. You have to say, oh, we're doing enough because look how many millions or billions we're spending. But as you know, David and, and all your viewers will know, it's it's about the impact and the outcomes, isn't it? So people feel that, okay, there's record levels of spending that go into some public services like the NHS, but if things are getting worse instead of better, if people's health outcomes are, are deteriorating, then you've got to look and see, well, are they getting value for money? Because people are working really hard. People contribute to society in different ways. But you know, when you look at the, the taxpayer's pound, are we getting good value for that? So there was a bit of a contradiction, I think, from Shona Robinson yesterday, because she then went on to talk about um, a sort of climate methodology that they're using now, which is really good and it's developing and it's very much about looking to see if government spending is aligning with priorities and is it having an impact? Because it is about that accountability, isn't it? About, well, is this actually working? But the other thing that came across yesterday is that they're really expecting public bodies um including, I think, local authorities or local council to dip into their reserves. So I asked some questions about forestry because that was one example where we know that we've got big targets to meet in terms of woodland creation, particularly native trees, and that's really going to help us um, you reduce our emissions with carbon sequestration and so on. It's really good, obviously, for the environment. But the budget's getting cut by about 40% for Scottish forestry, a lot of money getting taken out. And the answer was, well, they've got reserves they can use. Um, there's an example I want to maybe raise at a future meeting with them around transport. So I'm based in Lanarkshire. I represent Central Scotland region. Um, and SPT, um, who cover a lot of transport issues in the, in the former Strathclyde area, um, they've got big spending commitments because they need to upgrade infrastructure around the subways, a lot to do with bus as well. And the government are now saying, well, you should be using your reserves because um, we're not going to give you extra money. But they say they need that money. So we've got to get to the bottom of all this. Yeah, and and and, and, and the press councils have got any reserves left because they've been... They've been They've been absolutely drained of money, and some yeah. are not going into you know really hard times. So I think it's rich confidence uh, since they will use the reserves because I've been really surprised if these kinds of have got in the reserves away, but to a glass of hands, I think. And that's that's so worrying, David. I mean, before uh, 2016, um. I was around politics, actually, so maybe that's why you were thinking I have been around a little bit longer. So I was a local councillor in 2012. Yeah. That's a compliment. I really want to. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a real compliment. Like, oh, thank you. Yeah. And other thing that, yeah, I thought would come on to is, uh, I had a look at your equal side policy. That is, have, how long have you been working on that? And, and, when did that come on? So I was re-elected in 2021. Um, and in politics, you never know how long you've got. So I feel like I'm always a woman in a hurry and try to cram it all in. So um, when I came back in 2021, um, at that time, I was uh, in the Scottish Labour um, shadow cabinet and um, I had been tasked with the net zero energy and transport brief, um, which was great. And... That was also around the time that we were gearing up for COP26 oh, to take yeah. place in, in Scotland and in, in Glasgow. Um, and I think that was quite exciting. You know, a lot of people were taking a real interest. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of in the build up to that that I started to <laughs> read more and learn more about the campaign to criminalise ecocide and to make it an international crime. And what was really um, drawing me in is the fact that most of this work had been led by a woman from Scotland. And I'd heard very little about it. Right. So it was a woman called Polly Higgins. And Polly was an environmentalist, a big campaigner. And she was also a barrister. So she really had um, real expertise in the law in terms of how international law works. 
and she was so passionate about tackling you know what was happening to nature what we now call you know the nature crisis and that twin crisis of climate and ecological breakdown so she really spent about 10 years of her life arguing for this and fighting for this and mobilizing and influencing world leaders and sadly Polly died in 2019 after a very very short period of illness um but she's made a lasting impact and, and her legacy is um stop ecocide international she was a co-founder along with another amazing woman called jojo meta so i kind of reached out to jojo and just started to see well what is this international campaign and actually is this something that scotland could really take take on a leadership role um so we can't directly influence what happens at the international criminal court but obviously we can look at the law as it's devolved in Scotland. So I've been working on it now for a few years and you'll probably wonder why it's taken me so long, but as you probably realise as well, there's been a lot of conflict in politics. There's been a lot of arguments about the constitution, what's devolved and what isn't. And I didn't want this potential bill to be caught up in that. Right. Um, and I'm now, well, I've been on the Labour backbench she's now for a few years and it just it takes a bit longer you don't have a lot of resources yeah. and you don't have a, a, a big team so it's just taken a bit of time but I feel that things have now kind of a fallen into place mm -hmm. and it looks like this this bill that I've proposed has got a real chance of success. Uh, that's very interesting and uh, well when, when, when you talk about ecocide Crime, eco side. Are we talking about uh, about agricultural uh, uh, use of eco side and biocide, or or are we talk about large industrial hotels, sewage, petrochemical? Uh, so I suppose just a little bit of clarification. Oh. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, I've, I've jumped right in without really telling you much about the proposal. So what I'm going to do, just so I don't get any of the words wrong, I'm going to read out to you a definition that the international campaign has been using. And they've been using this to have uh, discussions with, um, sorry, my machine, hopefully it's not trying to do an update, that would be a disaster. Um, so they've been using this um, at the UN and discussions at the yeah. EU and with individual states. And it was an independent expert panel that came up with this legal definition. And the definition of ecocide that is being used is unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. And I think that's important because when I've been discussing it in the Scottish Parliament and with local communities is to think about the impact rather than say right who fits into this box yeah. so when we see um for example um massive oil spills in the ocean causing you know widespread harm long-term damage and probably in some <laughs> examples irreversible damage that that is ecocide now well, that could be an activity that has a license but when you have a massive oil spill like that, something's gone wrong and they're not acting within the terms of, of any license or any regulation. Um, some of the global examples have been around deforestation. Um, so I've been quite careful launching the consultation not to obviously get, you know, dragged into speaking about individual companies or individual examples because, you know, they'll just get their lawyers on. But yeah. what I've said is, look, if you're worried that you might be committing ecocide, then maybe you should get yourself a good lawyer. Um, so this is not about the day-to-day -day small acts, although they can be, you know, damaging. So it's not about people throwing a bit of litter on the street um, or doing things that could be very minor. Um, this is about probably what you've said, David, about the big industrial polluters. And those who actually know that they're committing ecocide, but they just yeah. know they're going to get a wee 
slap on the wrist, they're a fine and they, they build it at their business plan. So this is about how do we change behaviours and how do we change systems rather than having a go at individuals who by and large are trying to do the right things. That, that sounds a lot clearer. I know, I know but I suppose what I read at my first concern was, yeah, you know, for, for small businesses, for farmers who have been using that sort of chemical for a long time, and, and I don't think the farming community in particular get a bit of a kick in at the moment of the environmental people, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I suppose that was my concern, but you said that. I, I don't mean so I was there to, it's a bigger, it's a global, uh, yeah, you know, company who, like you said, they know they're doing it. And, yeah, and I, I do want to, and I'm glad to have that opportunity because I, I do want to reassure people, um, I mean, I know how hard farmers work. I did a, a, a visit to a farm um, over the summer and it was a young man who'd been Scottish Young Farmer of the Year. It was a really impressive, interesting story about him. But, you know, I was really impressed by his knowledge and just commitment to, to nature as well. And, you know, that there is a real appetite, no pun intended, to, to look at innovation, to look at how we can be more sustainable. It's also good for, for farmers and others working in agriculture who want to be more efficient and, and save money. But... They, they also need certainty from government and they also need protection from big polluters and big corporations. So one of the things I wanted to do, because I know the Scottish government has been getting a lot of um, criticism for maybe not listening to business and not listening to um, all the different stakeholders out there. So I launched a 14-week consultation on a potential ecocide law and one of the speakers was from a, a business perspective and she runs a business based in, in Lanarkshire and it's called Beauty Kitchen. Um, so it's cosmetics and other sort of hygiene products, but also she's got a part of her business that's really, really innovative. And it's all about how we, rather than have like single use packaging, we can do refill and reuse. So she's working with big companies like Marks and Spencer at a UK level on that. So she was saying like, this is good businesses would have nothing to fear. And this is like a protective measure. Because what I'm proposing, David, is that ecocide law is about a deterrent, the ultimate deterrent to protect nature. But if people uh, commit ecocides and are found guilty, then they could go to prison for a very long time under these proposals, mm -hmm. between 10 and 20 years, and also big, big fines uh, on company profits as well. Uh, so it's quite, it's quite a serious proposal. Uh, yeah, and it should be a serious crime because it, it's long term lasting effects, you know, a massive impact on the impact yeah. and and ultimately on on us as a as a individuals. So I think it's a really good thing. I'm I'm just conscious, you know, I, I think sometimes uh that there's there's bits of the environmental campaign that do concern me, you know, I don't know how you feel but re about rewilding, you know, for example, I, I think that the introduce the of our beavers and stuff, and I think the farmers get very cheesed up at that because, uh, yeah. uh, on the one hand, that uh, they, they do good things, they uh, and talk about beavers, not farmers. <laughs> I, I like beavers yeah. and farmers the two yeah, yeah. don't have to be in conflict although sometimes they, they can be but you're right there's always going to be tension isn't there always tension there yeah. and I guess it's about striking the balance between the two and, um, and hopefully in the future that's something back to the committee so we're also scrutinising the government's work on biodiversity yeah. and it's another one where the Scottish government, which obviously is an SNP Green government now, so they've got again really good aims and really good ideas, but a lot of the again the key stakeholders, particularly from the environmental um, bodies, are saying 
we're just not sure this is going to work because there's not enough targets in there, so then you don't have a focus. How do you measure performance? How do we resource the different actions that need to happen? So it feels like, given, you know, given how important it is to tackle the climate and nature emergency, you know, and to protect the public from the worst impacts of that, you know, like you think about some of the floods incidents recently, and it really puts human life in danger. So we need to get this right, and we're running out of time, but it feels like the government's also running out of steam a little bit as well, and they've got these good ideas, but they just can't get it over the line. So it's a worry, and that's why on the committee, you know, I really enjoy that scrutiny work, and it's about problem solving, and how do we draw in the people who do know how to do things and have the expertise and make sure that government's got the right people on the table at the right times. Yeah, that's what's about getting the expertise in. So it's, uh, it's you know, be with, the, be with the knowledge and the expertise who are making the, who are making the politics and not, uh, and not always politicians so oh, over that all it's really politicians <laughs> that have all the, the answers or any of the answers <laughs> but we're hopefully we're inquisitive and we're good at asking questions and and not afraid to ask questions because you know Scotland we can be a little village at times and everyone knows everyone but you know we've really got to you know when you come into the parliament you've got to be try to do the right thing and that's standing up for your constituents and it's trying to get the best for for Scotland. Uh, yeah, but but everybody wants but we all of us want the yeah. best. Um, I'm gonna pause it. I keep coughing and I'm going hoarse and I, I don't know what's got into me. I just keep coughing. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Well, hopefully you're you're feeling okay. And it's so hard to see a doctor if you need one, so Yeah, it's fine. It's just a it's just a cough and no. It's not COVID, it's not food, it's not anything, it's a cough. There's so, a lot of it going around. There's uh, a lot of it going around. Yeah. So I'll get some of my coffee. Uh, yeah, I was really come on to your work with disability and quality. Scotland, but I, I think it reminds me that you're a patron of that that charity. And to be honest, you know, I, to be honest, I wasn't aware of them. Of course, I'm aware of a lot of the disability charities. So maybe you could tell them about what what they cover and uh, and your role with them. Yeah. So again, I've never been a patron before of an organisation. Yeah. So it was, it was really lovely to be asked. What does that mean? Anyway, I always think of kings and queens <laughs> as patients or princesses. I thought you had to be a princess or a prince to, to be a patron. <laughs> yeah, it was um something that I'd always read about, you know, you mentioned the royal family. So anyway, this is nothing to do with uh, the monarchy. So again, it, it goes back to some of my work in the first session, um, the 2016 session. Um, and I was on a different committee then. It was local government and communities. And we were scrutinising the Scottish government's planning bill. And I'm a planning geek at heart. Um, I was a, a planner for a long time before I came into politics. So um, Disability Equality Scotland, um, one of the main things that they focus on is access panels. So they have a, a special role in promoting access panels. And there are many access panels across Scotland, but that's really about improving accessibility yeah. and inclusion and the thing I really like about that if you think about it from a built environment point of view and, and the planning system it's about making sure that at the very early stage um, in terms of you know the very early stage of design but even before that even just looking at your the map of your town or your city centre and thinking that well you know spatially what do we need and what are the opportunities but quite often, I don't know if you've ever come across this, but before you know it, 
there's been lots of money spent on architects and consultants and designers and a community has shown a plan and it's almost like take it or leave it. Yeah. And I just don't think that's a good way to go about oh. design. Um, and also it is getting better, but we still have built environment professions that, um, well, back in the day when I was a young planner, a young woman in planning, you know, we used to think it being quite male, pale and stale yeah. uh, and able-bodied. And so it wasn't diverse. What was that male, pale and stale? Yes, uh-huh. I've never had that before. It's quite good, though. Yeah, I, I did upset a lot of Labour colleagues years ago when I was a counsellor because, well, actually, it, it was at the time it was Ed Miliband was the UK Labour leader, yeah. and he said it when he was speaking at a conference somewhere in England and he was speaking to Labour councillors, and he basically said, look, our politics is too male, it's too pale, and it's too stale. So we've got a disproportionate number of men and not enough women, you know, um, we've got a disproportionate um, representation of white people and people from minority ethnic backgrounds are not getting a chance to serve their communities. This is not democratic. And yeah, it's just a bit a bit stale because if you've got people coming to the table with a very similar outlook, you're not going to get fresh ideas, you're not going to get that challenge. So, you know, in politics or in organisations and boardrooms, you know, the, the leadership and the decision making should reflect the community and the people that you want to serve. So, so yeah, and I think this is true for, for planning and um, decisions that are made about our built environment. So one of the things that happens in planning is that the, the, the local councils have got a list of organisations who must be consulted. So these are statutory organisations. And that includes community councils if they exist. So I was working with Disability Equality Scotland to say, well, these access panels are really, really important and they bring a lot of lived experience, um, but they're not treated with any real equity. And I don't think a lot of planning officers, like former colleagues of mine, really knew enough about them. So I was trying to get the law amended so that on that long list of all the organisations that have to be consulted, the access panels would be included. So I was coming at it from a, a rights-based perspective because I think it's the right thing to do, but I think it also makes economic sense. If you think about it, if you're spending a lot of public money um, to invest in a big town centre development or a new hospital, whatever it could be, if you don't get it right and you've got to go back and retrofit and change things, it costs more money in the long term. Yeah. And if people can't, um, obviously disabled people, again, are not a homogenous group and it's not all about physical disability. But if you've got a lot of people who feel that they can't be included and they maybe can't be out in the town centre, for example, then they're not going to be spending their money uh, well, in the local community as well. Potentially a large part of the a large part of the economy, then they but the that local businesses and could be missing out on yeah, so benefits. Absolutely. So yeah. that's a long way of saying so I started to really, you know, champion the work the Disability Equality Scotland were doing. Um and they were doing I think a bit of, you know, um reform within the organisation so they said look you know we'd really like you to take on this role because you know we see the value in having someone to champion you know our organisation and disabled people in Scotland oh. and uh, I was really glad to, to take it on so we've worked quite closely together on a number of things you know particularly during Covid as well because that was just a horrible terrible time but for Many disabled people and their families, support was just taken away overnight. And people were just left to sink or swim. As, as you were talking about planning there, I was thinking about the new, uh, the planning office in Scotland. You're probably aware, you know, there are thousands and thousands of homes going up uh, uh, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you know, I've been house hunting for the last year. You know, I'm quite over here. And that one thing I'm very, very 
because the developers did not build accessible homes, they did not build bungalows, because it, 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 it's not cost effective. If you got two hectares of land, they're going to make a lot more money building villas than they will building three bungalows. So they, so they don't do that. And, and I think there needs to be some sort of legislation brought in that says, well, if you're going to build X hundred houses, you, you know, so many should be bungalows or accessible. But uh, I think we're well, well, I think we're a long way from that at the moment. Yeah, no, I, I really agree with you, David. I mean, these are these are really important issues. I mean, I suppose we're discussing this at the time where we do have a real housing crisis, yeah. but there's a lot of things that we could do. So we know we've got a lot of empty homes that are just sitting there unoccupied. unoccupied. What's getting done about that? We do see lots of new houses getting built. And they're often very expensive and not not affordable to, to most people. But we're also building out, you know, these new estates. Sometimes it's flat development, city centre. But at the same time, we don't build the community infrastructure. No, that's right. So people are waiting. Um, people are basically queuing up to apply to be part of a, a GP practice. They can, you know, easily get to see a doctor. Um, we've got issues with our, our primary schools and secondary schools quickly become, you know, over capacity. They're not big enough. And um, this happens in South Lanarkshire where I live. And um, yeah, it's just you've got the schools bursting at the seams. And so there's just a lot, you know, I have to say, though, that the, the planning system has been taking a real hit because we've seen a real decrease in the number of qualified planners working in the public sector um, and that's a real shame because at the time that I was involved in planning I really really enjoyed it I worked in the public sector uh, both local government and the Scottish government and I worked in the private sector I worked for a house builder actually and I was made redundant which oh, wasn't yeah. great but that was that was like back in 2008 or 2009 possibly uh, with the financial crash but right now we're seeing house builders going out of business altogether, like Stuart Millen, who employed a lot of people, yeah. That's, that's so sad. Well, I hope, uh, I hope, I hope somebody gets control of the planning, you know, so because there's part of me thinks that it's out of control, because there's just so many houses are going up and up and up. And but you're right, it's make sure we're building the right mix of houses. And I think, David, part of the solution is we need to give, you talked about councils really drained of, of money and resources. We need to give councils the, the investment so they can build homes in their community. They know what people need. Yeah. People waiting a long time for social care packages, but also to get their homes adapted, which can work in terms of making them more accessible. But that can be quite expensive to do. And actually, if we can do some new builds and bring them up to really good standards and also make sure that these homes are really energy efficient because the cost of, of heating for people. Um, yeah. So that's, that's a real crisis. But I think that Often we look at, we look to the government for solutions, don't we top down? But let's give our councils more money and resources to build homes that really suit people's needs and make sure that they are accessible. And people's needs can change obviously over time. But um, yeah, you know, you talked about bungalows and they're really hard to come by. Um, I, 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 story. Uh, yeah, they are hard to come back, and when they do, you know, the you know, for example, I was talking in the area, and 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 yeah, sure, I came across bungalows. They started at nine hundred thousand, you know, so 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 when they built when they built bungalows, as oh you know, as as the real top end of the market, you know, which yeah. is out of my my humble. My budget, my humble. I don't like oh goodness, I think that's out of most people's <laughs> reach. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, well, let's hope I'm brief. The last thing I wanted to answer about, if we're doing okay for time, I would probably say you know, I, yeah, in twenty eighteen, you know, that the 
with poverty for a free period product for everybody. And that and that was really interesting policy. And was the ask it how it started? Was there a big cross party group on that? Was there a lot of resistance? How did that come about? Oh, we'll need another five hours to talk oh, about this. <laughs> I should have asked about that first. Oh, no, you're probably right to leave it to the end because I would talk about it all day and I'm very, very passionate about yeah. the rollout of um the period product scheme. So, yeah, I would say the origins of it got elected in 2016 and, you know, I will be political now. So, you know, I had been watching and, and realising the impact of austerity, you know, yeah. on my constituents. I'd been a local councillor and people were struggling then. And a lot of the research I was reading about was talking about women and girls are disproportionately impacted by austerity. So when we start to um, disinvest in public services, you know, cuts to social security and so on, quite often women still have the, the caring responsibilities within the family. Women are more likely to be single parents. So we were seeing more and more people go into food banks. You know, it's obviously increased even more since then. But at that time, it was becoming very topical. Another food bank has opened. Um, so people are very generous and donate to their local food banks when they can. But what was happening is people were supplying, you know, groceries and food items, but not personal items like period products. So I started to ask the Scottish government some questions to say, well, look, are you doing any work on this to see what is, you know, how affordable are period products? How accessible are they? And what are the issues around stigma? Because there can still be a lot of embarrassment talking about periods. And the government came back, in fact, Shona Robeson, her ears will be burning today. It was Shona Robeson actually who responded. She was the um, like health secretary at the time. And it was just basically like, well, we're not doing any research. There's no particular issue with stigma. And if women and girls are struggling, they can go to a food bank. Mm. And I really was quite deflated by the answer. And I was a bit like... I'm not often stuck for words, but I was like, I really don't know what to say or or do with this. So I just reached out and started chatting to different organisations, the Trussell Trust, who run a big network of food banks. Um, I was speaking to Women's Aid and Engender, who are the national women's organisation. And I was starting to speak to some of the teaching unions to find out what happens in the school environment. So everyone came back and said, actually, this is a bit of a, a problem. Wow. And it's, a, it's a, a hidden issue because people don't want to talk about it. So um, eventually, just to kind of move things on, the Trussell Trust were involved in doing some research and actually the Scottish government asked them if they would do that because um, the government were, wanted to have proof that this was an issue. So... Again, it's like, why can't we just believe women and girls that it's an issue? They're telling us that they're missing school because they're on their periods. Mums are going without period products to give them to their daughters. And food banks are saying, we don't get these donations, but we know it's an issue. But eventually, David, they did get cross-party support in principle. But it's easy to say, oh, yeah, yeah, period poverty is bad. Let's do something about it. When I tried to take the legislation through, um, at the time, the SNP government were really trying to say we don't need legislation. And they were trying to say that what I had drafted wasn't very good. Um, and they were worried that there could be legal challenges and different things. So they were just throwing lots of, I think at the time, excuses. But then something changed. I suppose there was a lot of public campaigning. I think this shows that grassroots campaigns and that public support does make a difference and at all the party leaders on side at this point including Jackson Carlaw who'd just become the Scottish Conservative leader and it meant that Nicola Sturgeon was the only one not signed up to support the bill and I think that just became untenable yeah and then they decided they would work with me and what happened as well this was 
during the pandemic, David, and, you know, I basically said, look, we know this has been a real issue. The government's worked with me to do a lot of good work. We've now rolled it out in the schools and colleges, universities. It's in some communities. But let's let's lock it into legislation because we're coming up to an election. Things could change and let's not lose the good work. And also, you know, periods don't stop in a pandemic and people need this support right now. So in the end, they agreed to work with me. We worked through it and Scotland became the first country in the world to introduce universal free access to period products. And the legislation has been enforced now for a couple of years, fully rolled out for over a year. And I would say it's going really well. There's a, there's a lot we can still learn and, and do yeah. better, but it's going really well. And I get many, many emails and letters from around the world um, saying thank you to what we've done in Scotland and also asking me to give advice to other other countries, other campaigners. So, yeah, it's... Um, I told you I was in a hurry, so I had to cram all that into the first session in Parliament because I didn't know if I was coming back. So I'm glad we got it over the line. Uh, yeah, but I think you should be very proud because, you know, I have had a lot of in different countries you know, who use Scotland as an example of a good policy, because it is a great policy, yes, they have. And uh, I have heard other people in other country documents. I've heard in document uh, how peers are around public in the workplace as well, you know. What we would talk about school and this and school, but workplace are, are another um place that it, it's not it's not spoken about. Yeah, no, I, I'm 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 glad to hear that you've been picking up on that. But the workplace issue, I'll give just one example because there's many, but the one recently, because people say why are you working with doctors? They can afford period products. But I've been doing some work with the BME in Scotland who represent doctors. And we know that hospital doctors work very long shifts and unpredictable hours. Yeah. And the experience for women and people who menstruate in a healthcare setting, particularly if they're working in surgery, working in theatre, maybe not always in the, their regular hospital as well, Um. And there's been some real like horror stories of like doctors um having to bleed through their scrubs and, and kind of work through it. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going in for surgery or a procedure, I want my, my doctor and the clinical team to to be um calm and rested and, and not anxious and not worried about try to get to the toilet or, or things like that. So it, it's a real well-being issue. So I've been working with BME Scotland and what we have is a commitment that all health boards will roll out three period products uh, for, for staff. Not, well, they're, they're doing it for, for the public, but to do it for staff as well. And some people push back to say, well, oh, well, doctors can afford their own, but it's missing the point. It's about accessibility as well as affordability. Accessibility is the key word. Yeah, accessibility. Yeah, I just want period products to be as accessible as toilet roll. So if you go into a public bathroom, there's toilet roll, there's hand towels or a, a dryer, there's soap. These things are a given and there's a, a, a code that requires that under sort of health and safety legislation. Period products should be normalised and mainstreamed. And I'm also, I won't say who, but I'm at the moment working with a very, very big private company that's um a, a global company but they also want to introduce free period products mm -hmm. for their uh customers and um if this takes off this could be quite a big quite a big thing because the legislation doesn't cover like private companies but again there's quite a few examples I, I chair um we're covering a lot of topics I, I chaired the cross yeah. group construction I'm doing too much I chaired this construction yeah. group and I work a lot with industry and again they want to diversify their workforce they've got a skill shortage part of that is about well how do we get more women and girls coming into construction jobs and that's not all about on site but they want to change their image and they want to have good policies on things like menstruation 
menopause, miscarriage, um, covering all the aims here. So again, they are saying, well, actually, we could do this or we're doing it already. And, and that's great. It's about creating that culture change. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a culture change. But it'll take a long time to become it's so angry and so embedded. The, the shame and stigma is so embedded. And I'm not tempted. But I suppose one of the things that I want to ask you, finally, it was, you know, since, since the, the introduction of DPA products, you know, as a way of measuring its impact, has it been monitored? You know, is there any way that you can see how it's benefited or has it been measured in any way? Yeah, so as part of the, the legislation being passed, um, the Scottish government, so obviously it was me as a, a member, but the Scottish government um, and future governments will uh, have to continue to monitor the impact. So a lot of that work will be led locally by local council. So in the legislation, the duty is on the local authority to have a scheme of access. Um, and I think it's, it's too early to tell, but... Initially, there'd been some resistance to people being able to order their period products and have them delivered to their home because people thought that would be too expensive. But then when the pandemic happened and everything shut down and it took a long time to get everything reopened, and I think because of the cuts to local government, we're seeing a lot of community buildings disappear or have reduced opening hours or we're moving towards more hub locations which which could be a good thing the hub locations but more things are being done online and more things are being done by post as well so that it's too early to tell on that I think where we're seeing the, the real benefits right now is an education and um, again a lot of this right now is anecdotal but I do a lot of school visits in central Scotland, across Lanarkshire and Falkirk in, in my region. So as well as providing the products, there's a lot of education work going around this in terms of um, just educating young people about periods and, and what is a healthy menstrual cycle and when people maybe need to get medical advice. And um, I think we're starting to see that having access to period products means that young people's attendance is improving and they don't need to worry about what happens if you get your period and you're in school and don't have enough products. Um, and the other thing is as well, this is this is not directly about the legislation, but it shows how it can have a knock-on effect. Um, I'll use my final seconds to talk about VAT. So a few years ago, VAT had been removed yeah. from period products, but we're seeing the market changing and period pants and underwear has become a bit of a thing. Again, because it's seen as being more sustainable and it's about reuse, but also some people have um, additional support needs. Some people have sensory uh, issues. So the, the pants are quite easy to, to use uh, as opposed to some other products, but the government, there were still VAT. So, um, I've been lobbying the UK government as of many others and they were initially very reluctant but as of the beginning of January this year um, these items are now um, exempt from VAT and again it shows how things are changing and government is actually getting with the times as well. Yeah which is all good and I suppose it'll just take time but it's getting there and uh yeah, I feel like we've 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 covered a lot of ground today. But it's we have, we absolutely have, and we've just scratched the surface, haven't we? We'll have to do it again sometime. <laughs> well, we can we can just do the whole we can do another lab. But you know, Monica, I sorry, I still enjoyed talking to you this morning. It's been great. Oh, thank you. Well, I feel the same. It's been a great a great way to to start the day this morning. Um, as you can probably see, I'm in the Scottish Parliament. Um, you can't see the mess around about me and with the storms and the weather. Um, it's a lonely day because all my staff are working at home. So thanks for keeping me company. Uh, no, not at all. And, and as I said at the beginning, I'm very grateful for your time. And I'm grateful to all my guests for coming on because I really enjoyed doing this. 
podcast. Pleasure. Bit of fun. I hope I get the chance and again sometime. I hope so too. Will you take care, David, and good luck with the house hunting. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you later. Bye.